Greeting friends, crew members of our beloved, polluted, and only spaceship. Which, since the last time we met here, has taken another turn about its imaginary axis. And, of course, it brings us news in full development. And as the custom, if I am not standing up, it means that I have a guest with me. And today's guest, for me, is an honor to have him here. Because he will be able to give us a lot about of the different situations that are happening currently and the ones that will happen in the future. Because everybody knows that there are plenty of vested interested in the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, and the majority of them are not good interests. Welcome, Rey Bernal. He is a man who has a CV that is impeccable, and I will try to make his curriculum be justice. He is a BA in political science in the Metropolitan Police Institution. He is an MA in war philosophy in the military uh, University of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. He was part of the revolution of the 27th of November of 1992. He was in charge of the special command at a tactical sense in support called Z. And it is called Z-E-T-A. Charlie Echo Alpha Tango. He was part of the Constitutional Assembly in 1992. He was a member of the Bolivarian Republic 200, which was then called the Fifth Republic Movement. And now it is the Socialist uh, Party at Venezuela, PSUV. He was part of the uh, military tactic that was against the coup. He was the president for the restructuring of the police department, and he dismantled plenty of mafias that were entrenched in the department. He was the general secretary of the local committees of production, POLAP. He was also appointed as a special figure of the protector of the state of Tachira. He was very young and he was the sub-inspector of the Metropolitan Police. He was the only officer that received prizes for fighting against corruption. And he received the order of the Metropolitan Police at the third degree. This does not make that man justice and this curriculum, but it does give you a sense of who it is. Welcome, my dear friend. What is the fundamental point with which you would want to locate us in your point of view, which is privileged and with your huge experience that is untransferable, that we want to showcase today to our huge national and international audience? Walter, first of all, for me, it's an honor for me to be in your program here, which is seen in various places around the globe, and particularly in the country of Venezuela. And it is seen because your program has an international focus about what's happening around the whole country. And with regards to that, we are going to talk about what is called, even though they are war actions against Venezuela. Now, pay close attention, Walter. Carbon de Clausewitz used to say he was a military and a German philosopher, and he had two very important concepts. First of all, what is war? War is being able to go against the will of the adversary in order to put my own will into them. And the second concept is to be able to have a continuity of policy through different methods. With these two concepts in mind, we have to analyze the different context of the last four decades after the Second World War. It is important to say that there's two types of war, conventional war, which is what we see with tanks, with aircraft, but the theoretical concepts is a confrontation between two conventional armies or two different states. That war was in vogue during the Second World War, a little bit in the Korean War and the Vietnam War. These wars are characteristic for being very cruel, very bloody, with huge amounts of loss of life. In that sense, the United States, who are the main participants of the Second World War, of the Korean War, and of the Vietnam War, particularly with President Ronald Reagan, they have a doctrine called the Reagan Doctrine. And this doctrine establishes the concepts of low intensity. And what do I say when I mean the conflicts of low intensity? The United States, in the fight for being hegemonic over the, con the planet, they interfere in countries, but not directly. They interfere through internal war, through religious war, through economic war, 
through uh, outsourcing companies or through uh, guerrilla groups. They are called low-intensity conflicts. And you might tell me, what does this have to do with us? Here we have a very important concept that has to be taken into account, which is called non-conventional warfare. What have people say about this? They said that President Chavez and President Maduro have invented terminology to justify what is happening in Venezuela. What happens here is that there is a manual that they gave somebody from Washington, which is the manual of non-conventional warfare. TC 018-2010 of the Special Forces of the United States Army, even though that here it says that it is confidential material, thanks to pa patriots around the world, they have been able to give us this document. And I want to highlight the concept for us to begin to understand what we're talking about right now. They say, what is non-conventional warfare? And it states that it is a set of activities that are directing towards the possibility of being able to have a resistant movement or insurgency in order to be able to go against, alter, or make a coup against a government, or to be able to take power through the employment of guerrilla warfare, which is done in the shadows in an enemy territory. This is something that I'm not inventing. It is here. TC 018 is the document number, manual of November 2002, and it's called Non-Conventional Warfare, Special Forces of the United States Army. So what does this mean? That there is a theory, there has been had a theoretical aspects about non-conventional warfare. And if we were missing something, here we have a pyramid that is established. And it begins here. And it says that structure of a resistance of insurgency movement. And it is a pyramid that talks about the periodicity of war. From the foundation of the pyramid up until the most bloody aspect in order to be able to have a coup against the government. I'm going to say three things so that particularly in Venezuela, we start assimilating what has happened to us over the last couple of years. And we have in the base of the pyramid. We have dissatisfaction with political administration, economic, social, and other conditions. A national aspiration. A little bit further, it says an increase to an infiltration of administration in policemen, in military, or in national organization. Further on, we have the recruitment and training of instructors. Further on up, we have the penetration of syndicates, of labor movements, and on the point back up, we have an open pressure, a covert about against the government. And further on up, we have an intense of breaking of the will of the government, of the police and of the military. Further up, we have war actions, etc., etc. And why am I showing you this today, Walter? I am showing you this because it is extremely important to reaffirm what Commander Chavez said at the beginning, and Nicolás Maduro, the president, has already cited this. In Venezuela, is submitted, particularly after the death of President Hugo Chavez, to a non-conventional warfare. And what is non-conventional warfare? It's the diverse modalities of war that goes from media war, diplomatic warfare, economic warfare, military actions, sabotage, infiltration, amongst many other words. In other words, it's a set of actions. And what is the objective? To be able to have a coup against the constitutional government of President Hugo Chavez back in the day, and now a lot stronger in the President Maduro. I want to show some slides that speak for themselves. The first slide, please. As we can see here on the right-hand side, we have South America in the map, and from right to left, there's military bases. As we already know, Walter, we have military bases, of military operations bases, intelligence military bases, communications military bases, and logistic military bases. As we can see from left to right, we have the base of Suriname, the base of Curaçao, the base in Aruba, the bases at a military level in Colombia, and other types of bases that are surrounding a very small country of 916,000 square kilometers. And the second question arises then. What is the objective of surrounding the country with 11 military bases, a country that is as small as Venezuela, that has a very small army, that does not have an aggressive army, that is not a country that is in open warfare with any neighbor? And the answer, as has been explained in various times, is because Venezuela is the concentration 
of very big elements at a strategic level. Venezuela is the first oil reserve in the world. Venezuela is the second biggest gold reserve in the world, the sixth reserve of diamonds, the fifth biggest reserve of coltane, the second reserve of water in the continent. So there are plenty of reasons at a geopolitical level and a geostrategic level in order to be able to surround Venezuela with these military bases. And please keep the slide on, because this operation that is happening now, we're going to go to the left-hand side of the first slide, please. Here we have Colombia, and as we can see here, from right to left, they have the seven military Colombian bases. And we have here, we have one in Malambo, we have one in Cartagena, we have in Tolemaida, in Bahia Malga, in Larialandia, in Apiay, and the one in Palanquero. We have seven military United States military bases, and this could be called a war doctrine, a strategy to be able to asphyxiate the country. Why do I talk about this? They close us in, military, and they asphyxiate us economically, obviously, in order to be able to be able to beat the will of the adversary. And what's the intention of the United States? with President Chavez and the President Maduro. What is the objective that they have with these two presidents to be able to make that population to go to their knees, to be able to beat the military, and to be able to cause Nicolás Maduro to give over the government or to be able to have a military who happened to him or because of a social explosion? And why is Colombia so important here? The United States needs a support base. They need a satellite nation with which they can be able to start their operation of non-conventional warfare against Venezuela. And you have to say this, even though it hurts us, because sometimes we were part of the Gran Colombia previously. Colombia, Walter, have 200 years of being treacherous, starting from Santander, going towards Uribe, Santos, and now Iván Duque. 200 years of vile treachery. And Venezuela has given 200 years of love and solidarity. Bolívar going past our commander Hugo Chávez, and now currently with President Maduro. But we have to state this. Colombia has always been treacherous against Latin America. You know this full well. Remember the Inter-American Treaty of uh, Reciprocal Help when the English superpower was the aggressor against Argentina, according to the Inter-American Treaty of Reciprocal Help, all of the countries of the Americas, including the United States, say that we had to defend Argentina from England, but this was not the case. That's where the treaty ended, because the United States had their partner in England, and Colombia, sadly, was also treacherous. So what is happening is not a surprise for any of us. And in this point in time, Colombia is being used as a massive military base in order to be able to penetrate, weaken, interfere, and destabilize the government of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. And this has already been said by Hugo Chavez previously. He said it in the Organization of American States and the United Nations in plenty of times. And now listen, Walter. The objective, supposedly, by the United States of having seven military bases was against the drug issue. And this is where this leads us to think. Up until 2010, Colombia produced, according to the Drug Agency of the United States, this is not according to the ruling party in Venezuela, they had 170,000 hectares of production of coca leaves. Then we have the Plan Colombia, in 1998 with former President Pastrana, and it was reinforced with the Patriot Act with Uribe in 2003. And what is the result currently now in 2019? Colombia now went from 170,000 hectares of uh, coca leaves to 210,000. So this brings a question to all Latin Americans. Plan Colombia and the Patriot Act 
Do they have anything to do with the fight against drug dealing? Or is it simply another type of objective of being able to close in the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela with the major objective of the United States of being able to take Venezuela due to the major strategic resources that they have. I was saying that this is a closing in an asphyxiation strategy. I talked about the closure, which is here credible according to our slides. 11 military voices that are closing in our small Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. And what comes now is the asphyxiation aspect. Here, I want to mention uh, Dr. Pascuela Purcio, who has systematically given her life to give a follow-up about the modality of economic warfare against Venezuela, particularly in her book called The Visible Hand. Not the invisible hand, it does not exist. It is a very visible hand of the market, because she stated that the individuals in their fight towards having benefits benefit the majority, and that is completely false. Pascalina has proven how there's a visible hand of the market that manipulates the variables of economy in order to obtain personal gains, particularly for the big nations and very powerful groups. And what does Dr. Pascalina Curcio state here? I'm going to read from number one to number six. And this is related to the asphyxiation against our country. And Venezuelans have really lived this from August 2012, but a lot stronger between 2014 up until the present date. 2018. The first element that they have is the programmed and selective lack of products and services. In 2014, we do not have uh, uh, diapers for children, oil. Our women were walking around and they queued up very long. And this was a programmed lack of supplies in order to asphyxiate the population. And in that context, there you had the local committees of production provision. This is an organization given by the popular power of men and women of the different communities that distribute directly, house by house, the food. And this committee have become a tool of resistance against the non-conventional warfare. They did not expect this. No, they did not expect this at all. And what we have in Venezuela, not only we have to distribute, they also distribute, they create, they organize, they mobilize, they attack the media warfare that the journalists have done this of the comprehensive defense of the country. These organizations that have come from the people and have been expanded by our President Maduro are a resistance tool. I had the honor a couple of days ago of being able to have a master's in philosophy of war. And my dissertation was these community entities as a resistance tool against non-conventional warfare. In the economic warfare, and a master's at that level must be congratulated. Every one of us who have some type of training, we know how difficult that is. In the second element, we have financial blocking. Venezuela has had the credit mechanisms completely closed by. Who have they been closed by? The international rating organizations like Morgan and Poole or GP, JP Morgan. Listen, Walter, the country's risk is graded according whether you pay or you do not pay your debt. Venezuela is one of the countries with the biggest amount of payment of the interest of their foreign debt. We pay $65 billion of foreign debt. And in the same period, our country risk went up by 220 points. So it has absolutely nothing to do with the macroeconomy nor the capability of payment of Venezuela. It is simply a modality of economic warfare against the country. The third element is the commercial embargo, which is undercovered. And this is a very big topic, but the Department of Treasury of the United States has hedged action against the uh, banking accounts of PDVSA. They have had uh, cautions against the movements in Venezuela. They have sanctioned all of the accounts of our financial entities in order to not allow us to have this flow of money. It's like if you have, let's say, $10,000 in your banking account. 
They close your credit card. They close your debit card. They do not allow you to do any transaction, amongst many other things. You have $10,000, but you can't do anything with that money. And obviously, they do not let you use your checking book. Absolutely. And this is what has happened to Venezuela over the last four years. And that's why this has impacted the purchase of food, medicine, tool supplies, repair of uh, MRI machines, of X-ray machines, of cars, buses, amongst many other things. The fourth element is a financial stop of the petroleum industry. We have an industry of high technology and we necessarily need the supplies from big companies that are produced abroad. But this economic uh, blockade does not allow those companies to sell things to Venezuela, for example, uh, the supplies that they need. X, Y, Z amounts of elements that, of course, has affected the petroleum industry in this country. It has completely halted the mechanisms of extraction, of distribution, of processing of our crude oil. And, of course, we cannot uh, deny this. It has impacted the petroleum industry. But it's not because of internal aspects. It's because a series of mechanisms that have been created in order to hurt our main industry, which is petroleum. The fifth part is to be able to have a stop in our utilities. Everything is concatenated. I can talk about uh, the state of Tachira. Tachira consumes per week 85 uh, Ga uh, liquefied gas. For those who are watching us abroad in other countries, we're talking about massive trucks of uh, liquefied gas. So right now, we have halted half of our fleet. And why is it paralyzed? Because of inefficiency? Because we want to stop it? No, absolutely not. Because we do not have, in order to be able to change this, we do not have batteries, we do not have the tires, and this has stopped and halted the fleet, and this has caused an impact on the population, which causes sadness and obviously a lot of anguish in them, because it is an element that is necessary in order to be able to have our daily day to life in order to produce food. So it, it is a war that hurts the person. And then we have an impact on oil. In Tachira, they have to have 45 truckloads of gasoline, of oil. But however, they only receive 30. And why does this happen? Because there has been an impact on the transportation fleet of oil, which comes from the state of Surya. And in that way, we do not only affect the transportation of gasoline or oil. This also affects hospitals, because if an MRI does not work, these uh, are Siemens or General Electric tools. But General Electric already said that they were not going to sell any type of things to Venezuela, and Siemens did not. So when they stop working these x-rays, this will not work. So it directly affects the health of the Venezuelan population. And the opposition, which is treacherous, they say no. The sanctions are not against the people, they're against the high corrupt officials of the president. And, for example, I have received sanctions. I am in seven lists, two lists from the Americans or from the Panamanians, one from the European Union, one from Switzerland, and I have had two in Colombian lists. They have confiscated all of my assets abroad, and I say, I find this as a huge joke because I do not have anything. I have not ever had a banking transaction in dollars. I do not have a dollar account. I do not have assets in dollars. So what are they confiscating from me? What are the transactions that I am not being able to do if I have never had a commercial interchange? But this was happened with various entities of the organization of the revolution. And who feels this? The people, the people that go to the hospitals that have to waiting for gas, they're waiting for gasoline. So the people are angry because this is included in this manual in order to cause discomfort in the population through different progressive mechanisms which are systematic that lead to the population to become extremely angry and they blame the government and they want to leave the government and that's why it's called non-conversional warfare. And the sixth element is the hyperinflation which is induced. Pascualina Curso states that that the two most important elements of economic warfare are the attack towards our currency and the hyperinflation which was induced. And look at these numbers that I have had. From 1999 up until 2011, the inflation had a variation of 26%.
So here we have the visible hand of the market of Pascualina Cursa, but from 2012 to 2017, the variation was 400, sorry, 235%. But in 2017, it had a variation of 435% of inflation. You know how much it variated in 2018? 60,000%. That has absolutely nothing to do with the economic variables. And I'm going to explain why. They say that inflation is a product of two elements. This is done by the right wing because Maduro has increased salaries in order to be able to product the working base according to this inflation and because the emission of inorganic currency. But according to economy studies, they establish that the raise of salaries have only impacted in 4.5% of the inflation. And the inorganic money, which they called, which is a product of being able to have an answer against this horrible warfare, has affected in 14.5%. In other words, what is the element that has generated this inflation? This is an induced inflation. This has been the fictitious parallel dollar incrementation, which is called the dollar today. And with that dollar today, it impacts over the imported products and over the supplies in order to produce products in Venezuela. So every time a supply from uh, agriculture industry is bought with a parallel dollar, that goes towards the prices. And this generates a hyperinflation. This is stated by Dr. Cursi, which is called shock of aggregated demand. So these elements, Walter, are the ones that we can say from Venezuela to the world that they have been applied to us. And we can assume that Venezuela is being attacked with an economic warfare as part of the non-conventional warfare. And this has been systematic starting from 2012. And they still apply this currently in 2018. Luckily, Nicolás Maduro launched the plan two months ago, the recovery, the economic recovery plan and prosperity plan, which is a huge mechanism which is associated to the petro, and the economic warfare has impacted in such a way that it started causing a distortion in that economic plan. And the president has had to adjust the economic plan one week ago. Thank God they do not they had did not have Nicholas's importance there. They say, okay, we're going to beat Chavez, and this person who was a bus driver is going to be deposed in two weeks. But Nicolás Maduro is a son of Chavez, and he was a foreign officer, and he learned from him, and he learned very well. And every single one of the elements of non-conventional warfare, President Nicolás Maduro has tried to find a different mechanisms to fight it. And this is what we're doing. This is permanent warfare. They're attacking us, and we're defending ourselves. They're attacking us, and we're defending us, and we're walking forward. And this is permanent warfare that we're living next slide please now we go to Colombia our beloved Colombia our beloved Colombia at the beginning we have to say that Colombia is like an aircraft carrier on the land and it is an aircraft carrier to attack the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, not only because they have given up their sovereignty, because as you know, and as you have said it plenty of times, they have been so treacherous against their own country that they signed a treaty where the outsourcing American companies and the American personnel are not subject to the Colombian legislation. They can steal, they can violate the country, they can kill, and they cannot be put into jail. They cannot be processed and they cannot be condemned because they gave up their national sovereignty to the United States through these seven military bases and their advisors are f in freely movement around the country. They do not have restrictions. Colombians in Colombia have more restrictions than Americans in Colombia. But apart from this, we have to say this very clearly. Colombia is the main actor of the guerrilla right-winged 
entities. When did these guerrilla right-wing groups start? They began when Mr. Álvaro Uribe Vélez, the former president of Colombia, was a governor of the province of Antioquia, and he created the United Self-Defense Agencies of Colombia in order to fight according to him to communism. But these uh, guerrilla groups are the ISIS of Latin America. The same thing that ISIS did or that they did in Iraq, the same thing that they have done in Yemen, the same thing that they are doing currently in Syria, that is the main role of the guerrilla right-wing groups in Colombia. They were created by the Colombian government, they were protected by the Colombian government, and now they are protected by the military and the National Police of Colombia. Next slide, please. And as you can see here on the slide, in this slide here, on the right-hand side, we have the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. We have the municipality of Arcevedia, which is called La Fría, the municipality of Marecucho, Coloncito, the Pedro Maria Oreña municipality, and the Urbanitas municipality. There are five municipalities that are in the border with Táchira. And on the other side, on the Colombian side, we have in Puerto Santander La Fría, the uh, band called Los Rastrosos, who has a guerrilla right-wing prison. Micro Clip controls, moves freely between Tibu and Los Frias. And they control the contraband of oil, the smuggling of food, the smuggling of medicine, the smuggling of drugs, and any type of illegal activity and they are called Los Rastrón. Then further down, there's plenty of groups. We have the cartel of the Golfo Escolar, the Order Sazón Paramilitar de la Frontera, Los Urabeños, and the Gaitanista groups. We have four right-wing guerrilla groups that are duly identified. One is directed by a man called Reinaldo who is the head of Cúcuta, together with alias Huicho, which is the finance person. Then we have another group, which was directed by Cocha, who was neutralized, but now he has a second man in charge. We have another band in Rosario, 10 minutes away from San Antonio de Táchira, is directed by El Popo. And these military, paramilitary groups have has already been established are extensions of the Colombian army. They are tools of the Colombian army to destabilize the border. And listen to this, Walter. What happens in that long and beautiful border with our bordering country of Colombia? 40% of what is produced or important in Venezuela goes towards Colombia. You will tell me, okay, Freddy. You have to put the National Guard, you have to put them in the border. The Guard are in the border groups, but it's a very long border of 220 kilometers. And although our army of the Bolivarian Republic is destroying them permanently, the evil forces of Colombia reconstruct them constantly, and it, it is a constant war. Our army destroys the trenches, and the paramilitaries create them once again in order to do this very big uh, business. In Táchira, there are 160,000 vehicles, but they use more gasoline in, than in Caracas. One million of gallons per day leave Venezuela towards Colombia through 1,000 different paths. 40,000 barrels of gasoline are checked into Colombia. 55% of what is consumed by Colombia, by Venezuela, sorry. So we have 12,000 families that benefit from the smuggling of oil. We have to say that the economy in the north of Santander, in other words, Cúcuta, Chinaco, Bucaramanga, are held and propped up by the smuggling of oil that comes from the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. And around this smuggling of oil, there is a growth in paramilitary groups and all of the economy of the north of Santander in Colombia. And look at this wonderful pearl that has come up. For those that keep on saying that the paramilitary bases are to fight against the drug. In order to process a kilogram of coca leaves, they need 36.5 gallons of gasoline. By studying the 210,000 hectares of coca leaves, according to the Organization of Drug Agency, these are 900 tons of cocaine that are produced per year. 
In other words, if each, in order to produce one kilogram, you need 32.5 liters of gasoline to produce 900 tons, you require 36 million liters of gasoline. That Colombia does not have, exactly, Colombia does not have this. And they unfortunately come from the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. And I want to make this comment taking this into account. This is so strong, this is so hard to be able to fight against the contraband and smuggling of oil. Because Colombian, as a paramilitary basis, are willing to pay for that at very high prices. If we regulate the international price, which may happen at any point in time, according to the president, they would do what they would do. They would simply add a percentage to the selling of their cocaine. And they require at any cost to be able to have 36 million liters of gasoline in order to process 900 tons of cocaine. And where is this heading? This heads towards the United States because we must highlight Colombia can sell cocaine because there is a country that is willing to purchase it because they have 48 million consumers of cocaine in the United States, which is produced in the Republic of Colombia. It is the strategic alliance between the biggest producer of cocaine in the world and the biggest consumer. We have said this plenty of times, and I love that you can confirm this in greater detail. But here there is an intermediary element. Intermediate, the DEA. The DEA, we have to establish, is the biggest drug cartel that exists on this planet. And this is a very simple element. When the DEA was in Venezuela, they did not stop drug uh, fields when Hugo Chavez in a sovereign entity established that the day had to leave we stopped 98 drug lords and hundreds of thousands of tons of cocaine that are still being detected the DA did not detect it but if they detect it the, are detected by the army of Venezuela so what does the DEA do it guarantees the free flow of that business that is necessary so that in the United States there, there is no social commotion because if they do not receive that amount of cocaine, they become crazy. And unfortunate, this will happen, that 48 million drug addicts will become, have, yes, the abstinence syndrome would really kill them. And look at this, Walter. In Colombia, they are so cynical that whenever they legalize the smuggling of oil and they have legalized the uh, carjacking. And you may ask me, how did this happen? Well, I can respond. Alvaro Uribe Vélez, Dr. Barito as I call him, created resolution number eight and other of resolutions so that every type of petroleum that comes from Venezuela pays a tax towards the mayor and it is bought by Ecopetrol. And every stolen car from Venezuela pays a tax to the mayor's office and the car becomes legal. So Colombia is a country that protects legally carjackings, smuggling of oil, and drug dealings. And we are the terrorists? Are we the terrorists? Are we the drug dealers? And President Nicolás Maduro is the big linchpin of the huge cartel in Venezuela? Is that what they are calling us? No, this is the cynicism of the empire, the cynicism of the United States, the country that, according to their own agency in drugs, establishes as the biggest consumer of cocaine. And Santos, President Santos said this in an intervention. They do not have any type of dossier for uh, drug dealing. In Venezuela, that takes care of its drug problems, they call us to a drug state. And this is huge cynicism. This is the strength of the empire over a country that they want to put their paws on and they will never be able to do so. The next slide, please. And here, in this non-conventional warfare, we have President Nicolás Maduro, who gave me the honor and appointed me as the protector of Táchira. And I asked him, President, and what is my mission? And he said, you have to go there and confront the multiple types of warfares of the Colombian bourgeoisie against Venezuela. 
And this is exactly what I do. Apart from my administrative task, apart from trying to be able to help in the governability and the problems with the Thatcher state, my main goal was to confront this multiple warfare that has to be said as a reality because Venezuelans already know about this. But in that huge amount of money, they have been able to buy public officials from Venezuela, police officers, military officers and administrative officers. I have to say this, it's not something that I'm proud of, but it's a reality that happened. We have dismantled over the last six months 34 paramilitary bands, 34 military groups, paramilitary groups in our territory. Yes, that's correct. And from those 34 paramilitary bases, we have processed 173 people. Those are the most dangerous that were sent to Caracas in order to guarantee their own safety, and the rest are being processed by the DA's office and the mi military and civil channels in Tachira State. They have been ca captured two people which are very dangerous, and here I have to highlight the actions that have been carried out by our National Bolivarian Army and the military intelligence departments and in the FICE that has had a fantastic job. These are the special um, groups of our National Bolivarian Army, and I want to thank them for their efforts, for their sacrifices, and their arduous work. And we also have been able to seize different types of drugs, money, and I want to say the following thing. When I arrived there in Tachira, we gave them a very big blow. We seized 23 offices. We have 600 cars that are involved in the smuggling of 600 automobiles. We have been able to put into four notaries, the chief of the National Institute of Terrestrial Transportation, and various low-level officials, and 23 car dealers owners. But not only this, in fighting against corruption and mafia, we have been able to bring to jail a great amount of public officers, some from the army, and I have to state this, when I have found officers from the army, the first one that I have been called is Alparino Lopez, and he has said, Freddy, I'm going to send you this and you're going to send them to the DA's office because they lack the honor to be able to be dressed with our honorable army uniform. And here I have a video that explains a little bit our action that was ordered by President Maduro this year. It was a joint effort in the military group which was directed by our Officer, Jefe de Personal Cedo, Ceballos del Chazo, together with close to 1,000 men that occupied for the period of one week this area where the paramilitary presence comes and goes. And I had the honor to go with this officer, the general and General Noroño, through different helicopter rides in areas where we have movement of the drug dealing bands. There was uh, air support as well. And we had the special forces from the Marine, from the Navy, from aviation, from the Army, from the National Bolivarian Guard, from the FIS. And, they, and we were there for a period of one week in joint actions of having our presence to reaffirm our sovereignty. We dismantled plenty of paramilitary groups at that point in time. We dismantled what we called chusos, which are deposits of oil that are located particularly in the municipality of Barcelona, the municipality of Ayacucho in the Tachira district. And this was in order order to reaffirm our sovereignty and obviously to defend our country and fight against mafia. And the next video. Director, we are going to put our next video that has been requested. Here we have the smugglers of oil due to the various blows that we have given them in sectors. They do not host any type of oil in houses. What they do 
is they hide them in the mountain, they come at night and they empty the tank. And then in the morning we have the tank and we send it to the border of Colombia through the trenches. And since we do not have the responsible party for this, which is the gasoline, they we destroy the gas, the oil. So as you could have seen there, Walter, with the instruction of President Nicolás Maduro, the military group like we always do in Venezuela, we have given multiple blows to drug dealers, to the mafias of oil smuggling, to the mafias of uh, the money that was being sent. They no longer do that. And this has given a result that various linchpins at a drug level have already been put into jail in Caracas, and some of them in Táchira as well. And obviously they are already aware that this is not a paramilitary zone. And I want to reaffirm this message to President Nicolás Maduro. There cannot be any centimeter in our Republican Bolivarian of Venezuela that has paramilitary groups, because that's why we're here. We have the military group in order to reaffirm the sovereignty and the tranquility, which is closely linked to the constitution of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, and, of course, to be able to respect human rights. Because even though they are paramilitary officers, and even though they are... Um, criminals, they have been given due process, they have the competent tribunals, and they can be able to defend themselves. But I can say very proudly, Walter, that we are fighting the good fight. It will not be won from one day to another. It's not an easy tax because money allows to buy different officials. Some of them are bought and some of them are threatened. But the ones that came up with Commander Hugo Chavez 26 of years ago and have decided because of our lifestyle to be able to follow and be loyal to President Nicolás Maduro, we will be there without any worry about the circumstances. A paramilitary um, officer threatened me and he, what he did was he sent a tape that said that if the army of Venezuela acted, they did not act, they were going to be uh, safe. And if they would act, he would attack our family. But when we have come here, we will put everything on the line. And even though we love our families and our children, we also love our country because if there's no country, there's no country. If there's no country, we do not have children. If we do not have a sovereign and free country, we will be unable to harmoniously live in the society. So I want to reaffirm in front of the world that effectively Venezuela in this point in time that I'm talking to you in 2018 is being subjected to non-conventional warfare which is directed from the government of the United States of America. And only two years ago the Secretary of Defense James Maddock Mathis has said that they have to change the government in Venezuela. And the President of Colombia, Ivan Duca, who is a traitor towards the Bolivarian movement, has established established that he will not accept the government of Venezuela after the 10th of January and that he asks the international community to isolate us and we have to tell them from here from your television show that in Venezuela and we have to tell them that we with Bolivar and with Chavez in mind we have decided to be free independent and sovereign from all of international interference. And this has been reaffirmed with President Nicolás Maduro. In Venezuela, there will be no military coup. There will be no uh, popular insurrection thanks to the consciousness and the high awareness of millions of men and women that was sold by President Chávez and President Maduro. And there will be no violence in this country. What we have here is socialism, more socialism and more socialism. And this brings us a very big challenge to be able to react the production. And this is a very arduous tax because of the financial attacks, because of the imperial threat. But in spite of this, on the 10th of January, write it down, Nicolás Maduro Moro will be able to be enacted for his next period as the president of the Belarusian Republic of Venezuela. And he will be supported by the people and the army of Venezuela. This non-conventional warfare, you have to have a different manual gentlemen from the United States because this manual has been applied to us and it has failed because we are creative, because we are sons and daughters of Chavez 
sons and daughters of Bolivar, and we are invincible, Walter. I undersign everything that you have said, and every one of us that have had military treatment and who have received concepts about the uh, honor have to congratulate you and wish you the best with that bravery, with that courage, and with this massive pair of gonads that you have in order to be able to be part of this. So we want to give you our biggest wishes, our best wishes, and since we are part of the same country, and this Patria Grande concept, which is the all of the countries in Latin America, we want to wish you the best from each and every one of us. Once again, this program has opened the doors, and whenever you have new news, please be our guest. No, thank you, Walter, for this opportunity, and Merry Christmas to our glorious people of the Bolivarian country of Venezuela. So wherever you may be, thank you very much for allowing us to be there with you. From Studio 3 of Venezuela de Televisión, the teen country of Cerro Marindo, where we started decades ago, we end our program dossier. The main program of the whole Western Hemisphere of the Satellite News. This is Walter Martinez, producer and producer. The floor is yours, dear director.